So on the bench here is several parts that I'm going to be using to assemble a slow speed carbide grinder. Now I've wanted one of these for years, for at least the last three or four years anyway, and I've never got around to either finding one used or building one myself. But I think it's time at least to get started on this project. Some of you guys may want to build one yourself because they're handy. If you use carbide in the shop at all, one of these could be useful to you. Um, more commonly used with sharpening hand scrapers for machine rebuilding, but for sharpening carbide in general, a slow speed lap is the way to go. And what I've got here, hopefully will make a decent uh, unit. So let me show you what I've got. I don't even know that all of it works, to be honest, but we'll find out. And if it does, we'll come up with a good design and get started. So here's a look at some of the parts that we're going to use, mostly reclaimed stuff other than some feet that I picked up, a strain relief for the electric cord, and a fuse block so this thing doesn't burst into flames. This is the motor we're going to use, an old dumpster uh, salvaged T-line laboratory stir motor that I put bearings in probably eight years ago. And I have ran it, so I do know that it, the motor works. It has a gear reduction on this side, which is really nice. So... 750 RPMs on this side, so 10 to 1 reduction, 7,500 motor RPM on the main, and on the secondary output, 750, which would still be probably a little fast for what we need. So we're going to control the speed of this motor with this Variac that I salvaged as well. Now, I don't know that this works, but they should jive together. So let's first wire those up and make sure it's going to work well before we invest much time uh, into this design. Got to make sure it's going to work first. So this old stir motor is really neat. Definitely an industrial piece. It is Talboys Engineering Company, Emerson, New Jersey. And uh, it's ACDC, so it's brushed. So it'll run on AC or DC voltage, right? It is 1.1 amps, like I said, 750 on the RPM on the redu reduced side and 7,500 on... Uh, on the main output. It is 1 18th of a horsepower and like I said, 10 to 1 gear reduction. So our Variac, or our speed controller that we're going to use is oversized for this, which is fine. And it is basically a variable resistor. So correction, this is not a variable <laughs> variable resistor. It's a variable transformer. And it's technically not a Variac either. Variac is a name brand of components that are very much like this and do the same thing. Sim similar to Bobcat and skid steers. Everybody knows a skid steer by the term Bobcat, but do you get the idea? Where uh, the brush is on the, uh, on the winding there. And it is a 2.25 amp uh, output, so that's plenty. And uh, it is 120 volt, 50, 60 hertz, right? So it should should work well. Let's uh, let's see if we can't wire these two together and test run this motor. Although I do know it works, I don't know that these will work together. So let's try it. So that is our varied leg, and then one and two are the input of the line voltage. Uh, soldered in a small three amp fuse there just to be safe. There is our input power to the actual unit. And now to the motor, the line on line. And then our very leg to the neutral. Okay, now I will cover up these wires and we'll give this thing a try. I think it'll work. As long as this is good. I don't know if that's full speed or nothing. So let's we'll see. Okay. It's either nothing or it doesn't work. Oh, it works. Yeah. Awesome.
want to get a look at the way that this thing mounts up. Hopefully there's enough space here. We can actually leave that on there. Oh, that may help us for a six inch wheel. So yeah, yeah, it looks like three and a quarter inches off the base. So we should be able to run a six inch lap. And this is one eighteenth of a horsepower. That's not very much really, but through this gear reduction, that should give us plenty of torque uh, plenty of torque to run, you know, a diamond lap, which does not require a ton of torque. And how is this going to mount? I think it's just standard nut behind this, I believe. And it is, so yeah. And then a key there to keep the body from rotating. I think it's going to work out pretty well. Let's get started on the enclosure. So I've got the mill set up here to give me nice even length and square ended plates for the ones that need to be anyway. We've got a table stop here that we button the plates up against. We've got a table stop down here set on the table so we'll get them all at the same length and the ends will be good and square because right now they're just rough saw cut. And this is going to be a weldment so we're going to rely on those ends when we weld this thing together at least partially uh, you know, to locate where they need to be. So if they're the same length and they're good and square, it makes things a lot easier on the assembly. So that's what this is. It's just a repeatable setup to give me plates good and square and of the same length. So the body of this grinder is going to be a rectangle. It's going to be 12 inches long by 8 inches wide and 8 inches high. I'm using eighth inch hot roll plate for this. I'm not descaling it or anything. You can see it's kind of bouncing in the vise here. I'm running at three times speed here on the video. But really you'd want a left-handed helix to push that plate down into the top of the vise where I'm running a right-handed helix and it's trying to pull the plate up. This worked fine in this scenario but you get the idea could have could have improved the performance here by just changing the end mill and obviously I'm running way up high on the end mill for rigidity just a small end mill but you know nine times out of ten the most upper part of an end mill doesn't get used and even if you've got an old box of dull ones they're good for stuff like this but you get the idea just cutting these plates down to length using my repeatable setup and that's how I'm gonna do every piece on this box So here's the top, the bottom, and the two long sides. Now we just got to do the two ends and deburr these real quick. So I've got a lot of work to do in the shop besides building a um, <laughs> carbide grinder, but it you know, I wanted to get started on this. I've got a lot of other things that I need to do, other jobs that are more important. So I'm not trying to spend too much time on this enclosure because that's all this is is a body to uh, enclose the grinding motor so we're going to do a good job on it but i'm not trying to make the world's most accurate uh, enclosure right
So these small pieces of angle iron, which are one inch by one inch by eighth inch, are getting welded to the side plates of this box, and they're going to give me a point to drill and tap so I can mount the back plate of this box, right? It has to have an opening to where I can access all the electronics and stuff, so that is all these, will, these are for. They'll get drilled and tapped, and then the back plate will get screwed to those. And I'm running the little Harbor Freight TIG welder that you guys have seen in almost all of my videos in the past. Been running it for years and have had nothing but good luck with it. I've not had the first problem with it. Other than its lack of features, it really has been a great little machine, although I do hope to upgrade in the not so distant future. <laughs> the only feature that this welder has at all is high frequency start. That's it. Uh, I'm hoping to get ACDC, you know, the capabilities to weld aluminum, one with a pulse feature, on and on and on, right? There's so many features these days that are useful uh, that you know I don't have access to with this welder that uh, hopefully we'll get to upgrade before too long. Run an ER70S-2 filler wire here, about 110 amps. So This welder will get you by. It's a great way to get welding capabilities in the home shop on the cheap, but it doesn't uh, really allow much room for growth. If you want some really awesome tapping fluid, the Spearcut C Molly D. I've been using that stuff forever. I finally got me a new bottle. I ran out probably two years ago and just never picked up a new one. But this stuff is awesome. It's a little expensive, right? It's like 30 something bucks for a bottle that size. But I mean, if you're using it just for tapping and stuff in the home shop, this will last you forever. It's great for stainless. So there's the box just set together. I haven't welded it yet. I'm gonna uh, make a 
loud noise and then place the motor in here first, right? It's got to be put in here. We've got to put a hole in the front for the shaft to come out of several little things that we have to do before I can weld this thing together. I want to do everything in the order of which I have the best access to doing it, right? So the neat thing about this is I could use both of these motor shafts, run this one out the side, this one out the front, and then have a high speed wheel on the side and a low speed lap on the front. It's an option, but to be honest, I got better options for high speed grinding in the shop already. And it's just a more work for something I probably wouldn't use anyway. So all I'm gonna do is use the one gear reduced shaft out, out the front of this thing. So I've scribed a center line on this plate, and now I need to figure out how far up I need to drill a hole in this for the shaft to come out of. So let's measure from the deck here, or from the base, to the top of this shaft. First, let's see what size the shaft is. Yeah, 312, so it's 5 sixteenths. So let's measure from the top of this to the top of that shaft. Okay. 3.362 inches. Now let's zero this and minus half the diameter of the shaft. So that, yeah, it's 156. So minus 156. Okay, so zero. And now we close it. So 3.2 inches off the top of this is where our hole is going to be. But this plate here, this edge, doesn't sit on the top of this, so it sits out front actually off of that. So we need to also add the thickness of the plate. That's one eighth of an inch, I'm sure. What the heck? Zero. No? Yeah, one eighth. So close enough, one at 118 thousandths, a little thinner, but you get the idea. So we need to add that 3.2 inches, so 3.3, you know, 3.318. Close enough, right? We're going to drill it over size anyway. So we need to figure out our center to center distance on our holes here, and this is not a square pattern on the mounting of the base of this. So let's take a couple screws, screw them in here. The okay, so what is the diameter of one? Because we have to subtract that from our distance in a second. So let's just say 0 0.182 inches. So measure across both on the outside. So it's 1.8 inches. So yeah, 1.8, we'll zero that. Now we'll minus the diameter of one of these, so 0.182. Okay, now we'll zero that, and now we'll close these, and that'll give us the center to center distance of these two holes that way. So 1.618 inches. So now let's try it this way and do the exact same thing. So what was that? 0.182, so zero, across the outside. So 1.4, 1 1.421, so we'll zero that, minus the diameter of one of those, which is 0.182. and have your calipers do your math for you. If you have a set of these digitals, zero that, close it, 1.238. Center to center distance between the holes, uh, front to back. So you get the idea, it's not, uh, not that hard to do. So here's another way to transfer your holes onto a template. It's just a white piece of paper, and I'm gonna use this corner over here as a reference because I got a square corner here. Let's that there. I'm going to hold it good and tight and I'm just going to rub these with my finger. Yeah, 
greasy fingers, so. This is kind of thick paper, but you get the idea. So basically, it's outlined the holes on the paper there, and I can just lay that on there and center punch right in the middle of those wherever I want it to be, and that'll be close enough for the majority of stuff that you gotta do anyway. So let's take a break from the grinder build real quick. I wanna show you some stuff that my buddy Tom Fleming sent. He's a viewer of the channel, been a viewer for quite some time. He's also a friend of mine on Instagram. It's at Tom Fleming. A couple weeks ago, I showed uh, me and my dad taking a trip to town and we picked up a crate of stuff. And inside that crate was all this, all the goods that uh, Tom sent me. So let me show you what he sent. I really appreciate it, some nice stuff. So thank you, Tom. So in this first box, nice set of brooches. These are overseas, but still they, they look extremely nice. So we got a 3 16th, should be an eighth inch there. Uh, probably a quarter inch and then a three eighths, I would guess. Yep. So decent imperial set of brooches. And if you don't, if you don't know what these are, they they're just a cutter for cutting a keyway into a bore. So this up here, well, it's kind of hard to see, but there is a brooch bushing. So you put that down inside the bore, and then you push this cutter through that bore or through that bushing, and it cuts a keyway, basically. So for hooking stuff up to electric motors and, and stuff like that, any driven shaft, most of the time we'll use a key of some sort. And this is the one of the ways you can put a keyway into a bore. So that's a nice set of brooches. Looks like pretty much everything's there. So let's quickly go through these other two boxes, then I got a couple more things that I'll share with you. So in these boxes, a set of Blaze Pro Tool adjustable reamers. Now I have mixed results using these in the past, but if you're careful and you creep up on the size that you want, I mean, they can do a really good job. And pretty much between the smallest size that the littlest one will adjust to and the largest size that the biggest one will adjust to, you have a pretty much infinite choice of size of reamer that uh, you can make uh, between the two. So they're neat, probably more suited for uh, you know, large equipment, uh, automotive, stuff like that. You know, you've got to be careful adjusting them. And uh, I've struggled getting good finishes with them in the past, but I've also been in situations where you know something needed fixed, and this was the only tool that we had on site to get the job done and it got a satisfactory job, or it did a satisfactory job, and everybody was happy. So it's great to have because it really does give you a lot of adjustment between you know, the smallest and the largest size. So those are nice to have. So in this last box is a really nice set of interchangeable pilot counterbores. So if you wanted the head of a bolt to sit below the surface, you would counterbore that surface. That way, you know, the head's not sticking up. And you can pretty much choose any size counterbore. Let's say you have a, a bolt with a big head on it, but the thread is pretty small. So these are the guides. So you could find one that fits in there anyway. Do I have one that fits? Yeah, okay. So this is a pilot that just keeps the cutter centered so it doesn't wander. And uh, pretty much that'll fit on uh, almost any size. Uh, all right, you got to adjust different size ones, but you get the idea. Hopefully that makes sense. So there's your pilot and your cutter. So Tom also sent a 50 taper to 2 inch holder, which is really nice, and a 50 taper. These are working my big K&T milling machine to, was that, a 14N super chuck. So that's nice to have a dedicated holder to a drill chuck. So... Let me show you the last thing that he sent, and it is the biggest item. So the last item that Tom sent was this very, very blue Colombian 5-inch fixed base vise, and it's in really good shape. Rarely do I see them that are as nice as this one. All the serrations are still on the jaws, which is, I mean, you use one of these too much, and or very much, and you'll quickly wear that down. And this one's still good and sharp. It's not all beat up. I've actually seen these 
broke into uh, in the back where people have used them as an anvil. This one's got a few spots on it, but nothing, uh, nothing bad. Check out how thick that handle is. That's every bit of three-eighths, three-eighths, three-quarters of an inch or more. Um, so it's a heavy-duty vise, and I'll probably put it outside on a work table and uh, use it out there. That's where I like, uh, because it's fixed base, right? You can really, really reef on them and they won't shift around on you. So a good heavy work table outside is probably where this one's gonna go. So let me show you the, the, uh, the label on the other side or the uh, casting, it's really neat. So there's a look at the logo on the other side, the Colombian Vice and Manufacturing Company, Cleveland, Ohio, USA. Rarely do you see them that are not beat all to pieces. So this will make a nice vice for a good heavy work table. So thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. So for the feet on this little grinder, I chose some half inch tall soft silicone feet in order to dampen any vibration that this thing has to kind of isolate it from whatever it's sitting on. So it runs smooth and quiet. That's kind of the idea. These are pretty soft and if they end up to be a little too spongy, I can always change them out with something a little more, more rigid. But for now, these are what I'm going to try first. So here's a tap index that I've found extremely handy. I keep it right beside the drill press and I use it all the time. And th this is Imperial, but you could do a similar thing in metric and you could make this in a block of wood. So on this side, it's a row of taps and these are the coarse thread. So there's half 13 down to, what is that, 256. And on this side is the fine thread version. So we got half 20 down to 264. The row of drills beside the taps is the tap drill for whatever tap you got there. So like here's half 13, then the tap drill for that, right? Half 20, tap drill for that. And then if you want the clearance drill for, for either side, you just use the row down the center. So if I wanted a clearance hole for a half 13 bolt, you know, there you go. So really neat little index and I use it all the time. Turn on the face converter. So I'm about to drill through the front cover of this so the shaft can go through, and what I'm going to use is a step bit. This one happens to be from Harbor Freight. This is a name brand Unibit. The difference in between these is that this one has a lot more steps on it, but the steps are much thinner, so you are pretty much stuck with really thin gauge sheet metal, like electrical enclosures with this one, where this one has large steps, and I can get all the way through this eighth inch material with one singular size hole. Not that it matters in this case because I'm gonna be going all the way through this with this bit. Another good thing about these is that they drill the hole larger progressively, unlike trying to plunge a three quarter inch bit through this, which does the whole hole at once. Uh, this does it in steps. It's a little easier to handle, so that's what we're gonna use. One of the cheap Harbor Freight step bits. So 
So when it comes to drill bits, you almost always get what you pay for. And some of the really cheap overseas stuff is not even worth bringing home. They're not even ground proper uh, in a lot of cases. I don't know how many times I've seen that. But this set of Harbor Freight step, step drills that I bought probably about three years ago have, have been great. You know, try not to run too fast and use coolant and keep them cutting. And I can't speak for all of them, obviously. I'm sure there's some bad ones out there, but these have been great. And uh, they were worth every penny that I paid for them. It's like seven bucks, I think. So, try set. You may be as lucky as me and, and get a good one. Don't be surprised if you don't. So it's time for me to weld this box together, and I'm not gonna weld it real heavy because it's just not necessary. Um, some good spots, and that'll be it, right? It's a box, it'll support itself, pretty much. The only thing you'd do if you welded it complete would be probably warp it all to pieces. And we don't want that. Now I'm going to spot this heavier once I get it all together. We want to put it together, it be square, and then it hold itself square as we weld it. So I just got the bottom two sides and the front 
just tack together lightly. I mean, it's plenty enough to hold itself together, but I could take it apart if I wanted to. And I don't know how many times I've seen people just go to town and start welding stuff before they put all the pieces together. It's just a good idea, right? Learn from my mistake and so many others. Tack your stuff together and remember that enough weld to hold something is enough weld to hold something. Sometimes full seams are just not necessary. Now I'm going to come in on the inside here and put some heavier tacks than what I have here. It's, but on the outside, that's all you're ever going to see is just that. So here's a good example of why tacking stuff together first is a good idea. I put that plate on uh, the wrong direction, so I gotta take it back off. So there's very few items that Dremel makes or sells that I actually like. Uh, I find that their little die grinders are just underpowered, like the air powered ones, and the one item that they sell probably don't even make it that's really handy is these small non-reinforced cutoff wheels you look at them wrong they break but man they're handy for making extremely small cuts So check that out. That's way off to one side. I moved the motor's location just slightly and then didn't transfer that movement onto the plate when I drilled it. So, I mean, I could fix it if I wanted to scoot the motor over slightly, but I'm not going to worry about it. But yet, it doesn't look very good. Good thing is, that's going to be covered by a six inch disc. Then they'll have a platen out here to adjust your uh, grind angle. <laughs> So here's a quick grill press fixture, just a couple blocks of wood, right? Some clamps to locate the corner of my workpiece here. That way I can get the hole on each corner at the same position, right? So this is just a pointer in the chuck right now. I'm just locating where I want it. And right there will work. So I'll drill that one, flip this over, butt up against this face and this face. Drill that one, you get the idea. Flip it, do the same thing over here. And then I'll have holes in the same position, right? On each corner of this plate. Okay, so fast forward just a little bit. I've got this thing together. We're still in the prototyping stages, but I'm getting getting a look at what it potentially will, will be. Of course, it's not even close to done. I don't have the front on it. I don't have the diamond lap on it. 
I don't have the handle on it. It's not painted on and on and on. I do have some decals on it. I wanted to see what those look like that my wife made up. I'll show you what she came up with. I do have my abrasive discs over here that I plan to use and uh, I have it wired up. So if you have any suggestions, make sure to put them in the comments because if you watch this video on its release date, I won't be done with this thing. So still room for changes. So let me show you where I'm at and then uh, next time we take off, you know, we'll, we'll start from here really. So the best feature of this grinder is that it goes from zero all the way to 11. Not just 10, but 11. So here's a look at the discs that we have, our abrasive discs that will go on the front. They are 151 millimeters, somewhere right around there, or six inch. And I paid $24 for all four of these ships, so they're cheap really cheap. We'll see how well they perform. Um, from 3,000 grit all the way down to 600. So 3,000, 1,200, 800, and 600 is our options. So we'll see how well how well they perform. But you get the idea. I'm going to go on the front here. I'm going to have an adjustable platen so we can change the angle of the grind. We'll be able to adjust the speed and everything. Hopefully it works out. We'll see. So that's where we're at. Uh, next time we pick this up, we'll... Uh, Take the next step, make maybe the, uh, the holder for these. All right, guys, that's it this week. Pretty good progress, I would say, on the little uh, slow speed lap, which I'm excited to add to the shop. Um, it's capabilities that I don't currently have. Everything that I currently have to grind carbide is either a bench grinder with 3,450 RPMs, which is pretty excessive if you're just trying to touch up the edge of a carbide insert or the cutter grinder, which is an amazing amount of setup to achieve a, you know, a simple polished edge, which this hopefully will do. <laughs> and I'm hoping it works as good as I envision that it will. It's pretty much dependent on the quality of the abrasive, which is in question in this case, but <laughs> 24 bucks, man, I had to try it. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my viewers, my patrons, subscribers, anybody who's supporting me on this project at all. Um, you make it possible for me to make these videos because it takes an enormous amount of time. You would not believe it unless you do it. Um, and it takes the sting out of it. So thank you very much. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. So that's it. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you next time. The birds fly south as the light Leaves your eyes Hold on to your dream Oh, I know you wanna scream Since the day you're born You're just a flower on your own Waiting for the sun to blossom It's now or never by my side.